بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله سبحان الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله لقد جاءت رسل ربنا بالحق قالوا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت عليم الحكيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقطة من لسان يفقه قولي فوضع أمري إلى الله بصير بالعباد الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين أبو القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين الذي أغضب الله عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويتحركم تطهيرا إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام uh, عليكم everyone and uh, welcome to our session to Quran um, the reason we I decided to call these sessions Quran sanctuary is because sanctuary is a place of safety it's a place of rejuvenation it's a place of feeling replenished and sometimes i wonder if there is a repetition in the messages but we are insan and we forget and we need reminders and that is why quran is a reminder and in our recent um, art class actually i was teaching about the flower and um, there was something really beautiful that professor keith krishlo writes in his book where he's connecting art and geometry and he says that flower is a teacher the flower is a teacher because the flower is a reminder and uh, the way it reminds us is that it takes us into a remembrance it takes us into remembering what we had forgotten so for us really it is never a matter of learning something new because the reservoirs of our knowledge are all within us we have the spirit of god breathed into us the one who is all knowing the one who is all wise so that so whatever whatever we feel like we have to learn or we know it's all just a reminder of something we've forgotten and again it reminds us of the promise allah makes in the quran right he says allas tu bi rabbikum khalu wala so allah is saying am i not your lord and we said yes and that is a promise we made to allah but a lot of mystics say that that promise is something we're making to allah in every moment and the interesting thing is that the way it is phrased the way this uh, this conversation is phrased it sounds like you know allah is kind of demanding us to submit to him in a way where he's saying am i not your god and we're saying yes you are and the thing is that um it's a promise that saves us it's the promise that saves us from our own inabilities it's a promise that reminds us again of our own inabilities of our neediness of our powerlessness of our uh nothingness and uh, it's a promise that takes us back to him being the rub the nourisher and today i want to read something from this book um sufi book of light it's a very beautiful book very famous book um and i want to talk about al malik because we're still discussing malki yawm al din and uh, this name allah's name malik malik Uh, comes from the root word malaka which we had discussed earlier and we were talking about how the the world of the malakut the world of the angels um is an unseen world where everything in the jurisdiction of god is being taken care of and we had discussed about imam ghazali talking about how there while there are natural causes and effects on the outside world the true cause of everything the true cause of all existence the true cause of anything being in function having a life is only one power of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he is the true cause he is the real malik who is controlling this world who is running this world who is taking care of every moment and there is nothing but him so in this book um the writer neil douglas he is talking about this understanding of al malik and he says that when you are guided to this pathway of the heart 
take the opportunity to focus on the I can, the vision power, the cosmos coming through you. And so whenever I would, um, whenever I would think of the power coming through me, I would think of myself as a, as a vessel, as a funnel, and an and imagery in which you see like a light coming from the high realms entering you and then leaving you in like a cycle in like a in something that is going through us and the power of i can uh, is also a power that is connected to the very powerful words of i am and a lot of times these days we hear about a lot of affirmations that our you know um faith coaches life coaches they talk about having positive affirmations and talk about I am and a lot of these affirmations will say I am healthy I am strong I can do this I am you know all these affirmations I am positive I am um, hopeful you know all these and um, it's really interesting that when we're talking about Malik and we're talking about I can it's because when we feel the I am within us, we can feel the I can power too. And what I mean to say by that is that, like I said, we're just vessels. If we're just vessels, like an empty shell, and all power is his, then without him, I am really nothing. But with him, I can be everything. Without him, I can get nothing. With him, I can get anything. Without him, I am powerless, with him I am powerful. And um, in psychology and in the emotional work, a lot of the childhood trauma that emerges um, in the soul and uh, that we work on later on in life, I, I feel I've had to work on a lot, is this feeling of powerlessness. Because growing up, we were from a generation where Children, uh, especially in certain com communities, were not empowered children. They were not the children that the ahadith say that, you know, when the child is from zero to seven and treat them like a king. And the biggest aspect of being a king is saying, I can get whatever I want. I can do whatever I want to do. I can be wherever I want to be. That is how children as kings would behave, that and then it's a very fine balance. And it, for me as a mother, it was very tricky because um, growing, grow, bringing up my children from the time I started with my eldest till the time now with my youngest, I'm a completely different mother because um, the ideas of spoiling somebody with love were so strong that if I, if I give so much love to someone that I make them feel like a king, that I make them feel like they can do anything, um, threatened my power, uh, threatened as a mother, and threatened me into thinking that this child is going to get spoiled. Now, if you look at the world, um, with the kind of gifts Allah has given us around us, he's doing nothing but spoiling us with his love. And then we come to the discussion of um, some people being richer than the others, some people getting more opportunities than the others. And for that, Allah SWT is saying in the Quran that you will get only for what you strive for. And I feel like when he's talking about you, he's not just talking about our physical existence. He's actually really talking about our internal real existence, the, the real us who we are, the one that we took that promise with Allah SWT. And so um, we again and again understand that we have to come from a place of realizing that we are these empowered beings who took a promise and the promise of Allah to where Allah is saying, am I not your Lord? And we said, yes. Um, the most beautiful thing about this promise is that even there, Allah is showing us that there was some free will. He was asking us. And it wasn't done without our permission. Imagine the king of the kings, Allah SWT, asking us, am I not your Lord? And then we're saying yes. 
And uh, that yes that we have said has not been out of a conscious teaching or learning. That yes is coming from a place of this inner realization of powerlessness, of really knowing every cell, every um, every part of us and knowing that I really am not nothing. And of course, whatever is, is because of him and he's the one who's nourishing and making everything happen. So that yes comes from a place of realizing it, really knowing it. And so coming back to the children, we grew, we grew up with a sense of uh, inability to exercise our power, a lot of us. A lot of us didn't, but a lot of us as children are treated like um, not so intelligent, not knowing enough, not um, having a say in the running of the, the chores around us, the household, the decisions. And a lot of times children are sidelined, basically. But children are one of those, uh, you know, stages in life where we're the most observant. We're observing the most, our hearing is the sharpest, and we're very alert. We're always eavesdropping on adult conversations. And um, so as children, we will make memories. And when we create memories, when we, when we are, um, when we're uh, surrounded by an environment where we are not feeling empowered, where the, and you see, Allah says that we have that for Khan within us, right? Of the right and wrong. A lot of the children will grow up seeing a lot of injustice happening around them. They will see a lot of patriarchy around them. They will see a lot of um, unfairness happen around them. And they will see the right from the wrong. They will know what is right and what is wrong, where the injustice was happening. But as children, because they were not allowed to voice it, as children, they were not allowed to speak their mind and say, you know, I don't think what dad is doing is right, or I don't think what mom is doing is right. They don't have that security to speak their mind. Just the act of, just the inability to speak their mind becomes their source of feeling powerless. Okay. And that sense of powerlessness seeps into us as adults. Because we come to a belief system that I cannot speak. I am not safe to voice my opinion. I cannot change anything. So while a child cannot say anything, the, the child cannot uh, speak their mind, the second thing that they cannot do is that they cannot bring about a change. They cannot, they cannot feel like they have any power in creating a change around them. And then they realize that not only can they not have the power to, for example, relieve the person in question around them from their pain, agony, and injustice, they themselves as children are going through the pain of feeling this injustice, this pain around them. And um, a lot of times this pain can harden us because um, as human beings, we try to run away from pain. So when we're hurt, we immediately want to get rid of the pain. So we go into painkillers. We go into go seeing a doctor. We go into, you know, taking anything that would numb that pain because pain makes us restless. Pain makes us uncomfortable. And so when we don't want to feel the emotional pain, we numb ourselves. We want to numb the part that is feeling and that's when we create emotional blocks because we don't want to feel the pain of powerlessness. We don't want to feel the, the pain of voicelessness. And the reason it's so important to discuss the idea of powerlessness here um, in connection to the names of Allah. And as a woman, I can say that we're still living in a world where uh, a lot of parts of the world will not give women that voice of equanimity, of equality in, in the sense of uh, expression. Um, and there is a lot of shaming around voicing yourself. 
um, there's a lot of shaming around expression of emotion. And while there is a toxic expression of emotion, there is a way of expressing ourselves which can be very derogatory, very, um, uh, you know, dis disrespectful towards other human beings. Uh, there is also this um, idea of, you know, not speaking our emotion. Um, so, if the, for example, if a, if a woman is hurting and she says, I'm hurt, or this is not, this is upsetting me, then, you know, a lot of times we'll be shamed as sen sensitive and not being strong enough to go through with the circumstances, etc., depending on what part of the world or family we're in. But this is generally what I um, have observed. So we're sitting on a whole load of unwanted sense of powerlessness. We're sitting on a whole load of, you know how Rumi says that the door is open. You, you can just leave and fly a lot of times, but you're just thinking that you're caged. So a lot of times it is us who will get in the way of ourselves. And no, saying that us getting in the way of ourselves is to say that there are these emotional blocks that we develop as children and then they stay dormant within us doing their work with us not realizing but then they have to be addressed and extrapolated and seen now there's a beautiful word um, you know we've entered rajab and we're on our way to the beautiful month of ramadan and the word ramada uh, means transformation of um, if i'm not wrong transforming something with the strong heat of light. And the strong heat of light uh, can, can change the state. And, uh, you know, like, uh, like drops of water falling on a rock will transform it. The sunlight will, will transform the state of so many living habitat, right? Uh, the sun causes the growth of the seed. The sun causes food to grow, the sun causes so many of these natural phenomena to happen. Ramada comes from that. And uh, one of the most beautiful things about the transformation inside a human being is just like um, there is darkness and when the sun comes, there is light and you can finally see because you couldn't see earlier, it was dark and now you can see uh, through the sun and the light, the same way a human being transforms when awareness comes. When there's a light of awareness, there's a transformation. So the most empowering thing about us is that what Eckhart Tolle says is that all we need to do is become aware. And when the light of awareness shines on the inner world, it transforms it. So all we need to do is become aware, is to wake up is to light up and say i'm awake and i'm not going to do um i'm not going to do life sleeping unaware of whatever is going on inside me and there's a beautiful saying of um, carl jung and carl jung says that as long as the subconscious does not become conscious life will keep happening to you and you'll call it fate so the idea is that the power of I can in the name of Allah al-Malik is going to be a work within me of realization, of self-knowing to the extent of which I can. This vessel that Allah has created with whatever he's put in there, there's a lot of I can in there which has not been realized, that has not been, the potential has not been tapped into because I'm sleeping, I'm dormant, I'm not awake to my potential. And um, this beautiful writer, uh, Marian uh, Williamson, a uh, beautiful writer, uh, she has this very famous saying which was mistakenly attributed to Nelson Mandela. And she says that our biggest fear is not our powerlessness, our biggest fear is our power. It's the light within us. We're scared of what, to what extent, what I can do. When If the lioness wakes up and the lion wakes up, you know, you're scared what the lion's going to do. And a lot of times I have realized personally that um, being the sort of person I am, I would avoid um, 
going into a situation because number one, I'm ashamed that if something angers me, then I'll, you know, I'll get too emotional about it. I might disrespect somebody and uh, I might say things that I'll regret later because something is hurting me, right? Something is poking my heart. And now eventually, if I suddenly decide to um, face it, then I might be disrespectful. I might say things which I don't want to say. I might be angry. And then I am not just ashamed of myself to express myself. I'm also feeling very powerless again in the way I will handle the situation. I am feeling like I won't be able to control myself when I'm in, an, in a situation which is angering me, which is, which is vexing me, which is creating rage within me. I have not come to realization that, look, I have the power in how I express myself. I do have that power. But I'm thinking, oh, you know, I'm a woman and I'll just lose it. And so many times I've lost it in so many situations, I can't control myself. So that's number one. And the other thing is that when I'm going into a situation, I am already feeling ashamed of myself. I'm already ashamed of myself for who I am. I'm already feeling ashamed that I'm the kind of person who loses it, who screams, who shouts, who, who won't have control over her emotions, who won't have, you know, all of that. So the idea over here is that when we become aware of all of this, of saying, wait a second, I want to be the one controlling. And, you know, very conventionally, when we read religious texts, they will always say that the soul is like a horse, uh, the, the body is like a horse. And the soul is the one who is, you know, has the reins of the horse in, in its hands. And what we mean by that is that the qualities of anger and uh, the qualities of rage are to be harnessed. So the power of anger has to fuel us into, into redemption, into uh, reformation, into transformation, into going into the world and creating a change because there's an anger, there's a rage rage towards what is wrong what is in unjust what is not fair but the work of the soul is to awaken to that anger not unleash it without a senselessness with as a reaction but the power of the sword soul is to awaken to that anger and instead instead of dealing with it with a reaction we, we deal with it with a response and that's where the difference comes, where we are not sleeping anymore. We're not unawakened anymore. We're not um, in our slumber of whatever's going on. And I'm just reacting to it as a chain effect. But I am going to now respond to it with a feeling of empoweredness, a feeling of I can. I can handle this situation with a pause. I can do it with husne ikhlaq. I can do it with respect. I can do it with the best of manners. I can, I can. And that's the feeling that Al Malik is going to give us. And that feeling of I can is the emulation of Allah's name, Al Malik. And so um, I'm going to read a little bit now from this book. And um, I hope that I have connected these ideas properly of how our childhood and its feelings of powerlessness can seep into our adulthood and we need to become aware of all of this. Now, I do feel that there's a need to also talk about what Rumi says, that we feel that we're powerless and um, we're sitting in a, in a cage of, made of our own thing and, and the door is open and we're not leaving. Now, um, recently I had come across this beautiful thing, which is always a reminder for me, when you cannot change the situation, the most empowering thing about any um, disempowering situation is that the power to change ourselves is always in our hands. No one can take away that power. And that's the most empowering part of doing this life, that the truth of this life is that in reality, we cannot blame anyone. 
there is no place for blaming. We do it, we're human, and please be kind to yourselves. But at the same time, there's, we, can, we can express a sigh of relief in knowing that nobody can take away that power from me of who I am, even if we are, God forbid, paralyzed, even if we are completely powerless on the outside, we don't have a voice. The inside always stays ours. And as soon as we become um, aware of this power, the I can returns. And like Carl Jung was saying, that if we don't make the subconscious conscious, we will call whatever is happening to us fate is because when Allah is saying that whatever is within us is also in the alpha, is also in the horizons, he's saying that whatever is within you is, a, is being reflected on the outside. And um, while I haven't completed my study into the way we work as mirrors to the world, because there's a couple of ways, um, the way the world reflects our inner states is number one, who we are. So, you know, what? whoever we see in our life, a person with anger, a person who's controlling, a person who's, um, you know, ill-mannered, for example, perhaps. So we, we come across these people in our life, right? And they hurt us and they affect us. And a very beautiful way to start our journey into self-empowerment is to say, whatever I'm seeing here, there's a part of it which is within me now. I'll give you an example of a woman who is very subdued, very kind, very giving, very loving, doesn't, you know, doesn't react, um, you know, always trying to make peace in the house, very loving. But her husband is super angry and super aggressive and, you know, never happy. So she can turn around and say, look, I'm not angry. I'm not violent. I'm not using bad language. You know, look at look at this guy. How can he be how can he be reflecting who I am? And this was a case that I was like I was in a person I was in touch with and helping out. And yes, that question really bugged me. Like I was confused for a long time until one day it occurred to me that the anger that this man is reflecting to this woman is all of the suppressed anger that woman was sitting on. So he was a reflection of something she was not willing to see within her. She was not willing to see that what this man is representing is my inner stuff, my inner state, which I have just completely shut and hidden inside of me. And now, you know, I'm trying to be all nice and kind and keep the peace in the house and, you know, make everybody happy with each other. And, you know, always avoiding conflict. I don't want conflict in my house. I want a peaceful home. But then she's not communicating. She's not communicating the things that are hurting her. She's not communicating the things that are upsetting her. She's not communicating the disrespect she's receiving. And in that way, that man has now become a mirror to her inner states, which she does not want to see because she's also afraid that if she goes there, she doesn't know what's going to happen. It's going to be the world of the unknown. She doesn't know that if her timidity and her submissiveness, which gains the love of so many, approval of so many people, that makes her feel like she's wanted, that she's loved, that she is accepted, all of that might go away. And that would mean the ground shaking under her feet. What if people don't love her anymore? What if she's not accepted anymore? What if um, she's not liked? You know how uh, Facebook and Instagram has, has manifested this human need to be liked? We're constantly seeking the number of likes on our posts. This is our human nature, which if, un, uh, you know, if unexplored, if, if we don't become aware of it, can take us down a, a road which can take us away from ourselves. So in not wanting to see the things that anger me and holding on to that anger, I am doing a disservice to myself of not knowing myself of not going and saying, I want to see myself. So in all of these uh, ideas that I've expressed today, the idea is again, if we do not know ourselves, if we do not know where I can, where my power lies, 
if we, if I don't want to explore my powerlessness, so I can empower myself with the power of I can, which lies within me, then, you know, I am doing a disservice to my life, to my purpose, to my God, and to everything this life holds. And that's how we understand the difference between um, between surrendering in a hopeless, helpless way of becoming a doormat and the difference between surrendering to the flow of life, but as an empowered human being, as, a, as, a, as the one who, who's, who's Allah has got their back. Um, a lot of times, you know, we as women, when we are not supported um, and we have to stand up for the things that people don't understand, people start saying, what has happened to her? Why has she suddenly become so different? What, you know, when we take the power and control in our hands, we change, right? Now, when we do that, a lot of times, um, I don't know what I was going to say, but um, I'm just going to take a pause to bring back my thoughts. Um, can anyone remind me what I was saying before this sentence? Um, just about the powerless, powerlessness of women and how we feel um, we need to feel empowered. Right. And so uh, thank you so much, Rowan. Um, so as women, when we come to a place of realizing our power and then, yes, I was talking about surrender, the two kinds of surrender. Thank you so much. As women, when we come to a place of transforming ourselves and taking the power back in our hands, and moving away from that um, narrative of, uh, you know, being under someone all the time, uh, forgetting the examples of Bibi Khadija and Bibi Fatma and all of these people who, these powerful women who were so empowered, you know, they were so empowered that we see the prophet standing up for his daughter. And, um, you know, it's so interesting that uh, one time, you know, somebody said that, you know, my, my father didn't treat me right. Um, and uh, they turned around and they said that, well, uh, you were not Fatima, you know, you, you were not of that level um, of her, of Bibi Fatima Zahra, so you, you didn't really deserve to be treated like that. You know, these are the jargons, these are the conversations, these are the ways of twisting um, things in life that we... Um, but that we come across and so the woman said turned around and said but then you are not the father Rasulullah was either I mean these are conversations that come from a place of anger and but they're true and the idea is to take our power back and say well I am me and I am loved enough to be here to be brought into existence I am here because I have a purpose and Allah is constantly uh, reminding us in the Quran that everybody is equal, you know, everybody's got that, uh, that nafaqtahu fihim and ruhi, the, 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 the wise children of God, you know, your khalifatullah, all of that, of course, applies equally. So now what is surrender? When we have that inner power of knowing that I can and the malik is, you know, standing by me, it almost feels like whether you're an orphan or not, whether your father supports you or not, come to a place of realization that my rub has got my back. Now, if you have to face somebody and you're feeling insecure, then a lot of times that translates as very angry outbursts because you're feeling insecure, because you're feeling powerless, you're, you're already coming from a belief system that I will not be heard. So, so there's a generally natural tendency to raise the volume and talk very loudly and scream because um, someone uh, very nicely uh, explained to me, why do people scream even when you're standing right across? Even why are we talking loudly and trying to express our point of view to somebody who's standing right in front of us in the same room? is because emotionally we're not feeling heard. So the natural reaction to not feeling heard is that I will talk loudly physically because I feel like if I talk loudly, maybe my voice will be heard. But it's an emotional state of feeling not heard. 
But what if you could imagine like God has got your back and he's like your Malik and he is standing right behind you, holding you and giving you that support. Then you walk in with a confidence, which is very different. Then you don't need to raise your voice. You know, Rumi says, don't raise uh, your voice, raise your words. And the power of our word is in the power of, of the, the realization of Allah being so close to us. Um, friends, I am going to finish a little early today because my kids are traveling and I need to um, get get back to them. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit, maybe just 10 more minutes and then go. So um, when we're guided to the path of Al-Malik, then it's a path of realizing the I can. I'm just going to read a little bit from here. No compromise, no nonsense. Sometimes in life, you must decide to go for your own full realization as a human being, no matter what it takes. Usually it takes some great crisis to bring us to this point. Pain is often the greatest motivator when it comes to envisioning an entirely new life. Boredom and a habitual sense of playing safe keep this vision power bottled up within us. This is all we've been talking about today. In many Sufi stories, a dervish shocks those around him into looking at life completely differently. The Sufis tell many stories like this about Jesus, whom they call the breath of God and revere as a great dervish. One day, Jesus was walking with his disciples when they saw a dead dog up ahead. The disciples wanted to pass on the other side since the dog was considered unclean. But Jesus made them stop in front of it and look. Then he commented, look how beautifully white its teeth are. And uh, subhanAllah, that is the power of perception. That is the power of having positive thinking. And um, here Jesus forces his students to ignore meaningless superstition and find something totally unexpected. The reflection of divine light in what they would otherwise have avoided. One of Jesus' famous sayings from the Gospel of Thomas could easily express the theme of this pathway. If you give birth to what is within you, the voices you redeem will redeem you. If you fail to find and give birth to them, they become part of what is destroying you. Again, this is the idea of becoming aware, the idea of um, hearing yourself, watching yourself. and. Um, so when I um, was coming into the session today, there was this powerful inspiration in the idea of this positive thinking. And uh, I wanted to somehow express the connection of uh, Allah's name, Ya Salam, with Al-Malik. You know, usually the name Al-Malik is um, taking in a very authoritative way. And uh, the most amazing thing that has happened to me uh, in this journey is to realize that all of the names of Allah are not about what Allah is doing to me as a Malik, as a Qadir, as a Muzil, as a Qahar, but what is it that I am doing as those names, what I am doing as the emulation of those names. So um, the idea is that... Um, when we come to realize this um, name of Al-Malik and we realize that the inner power lies in, you know, changing my own perception, changing my own outlook, changing the way I see life, then in truth, our restlessness, our pain and discomfort dissipates if we were to pray to Allah in the most trying of situations, in the most painful of situations, especially happens when a mother is seeing something painful in their children that is hurting them, bringing discomfort, and you feel this lack of control. It could be a physical thing. It could be an emotional thing. And it, the pain is so gripping. Now, in that situation, the true power really lies in, of course, doing what you can do, then leaving it with Allah. But the true prayer of, if you know, if, if we were to bring back our intention into saying, um, the truest, the most purest, the best of intentions is 
bring i want to be close to allah even in that situation okay my son is unwell qurbatan illa allah how does that make sense the way it makes sense is that on the outside there is something um that is perturbing me which is disturbing me which is like out of my control but when i say allah bring me close to you you know the beauty of that prayer is that if allah can bring his salamti he can bring his salam his peace within my heart then that's all i need and i was actually contemplating on the son of hazrat nu and this is just my uh, you know my insight and i haven't checked it with anyone but i was actually thinking that hazrat nu is asking about his son from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and saying you know he's going on the wrong path in front of me and allah is saying he's not one of the believers and i feel like out of all the tests for a prophet maybe hazrat nu's test was one of the difficult because being a prophet knowing that this is not the true reality of life and knowing all of what he knew to see his own child his own son go the wrong way and allah is saying he's not one of the believers is such a huge place of wanting to say allah just bring peace into my heart you know of letting go of saying these are not my children they're off you they're from you they're just coming through me and you're the true rab and you will guide them and you will take them to where you need to take them and i have to let go at some point and i have to say you know yes they came through me but they're not mine i cannot control any of it and in that state of pain emotional pain physical pain all of that pain the true power comes when we can bring peace into our hearts and to pray allah fill my heart with peace so the point i'm trying to make over here is that whether the outside situation is full of trauma pain helplessness distortions and all of that and th- at times you might feel like hey listen maybe i was fooled all my life you know there are these moments where we are weak and do a lot of things we're like hey was i fooled were people taking advantage of me how can i trust anyone all of that it's all part of emotional anxiety all of these thoughts and the one thing that can save us in all of this is salamti is the peace is the peace in my heart of knowing that al malik is after all the controller and the overlooker of all the situations and nothing has been lost forever nothing has been eternally damaged nothing has been wrongfully taken away from me all of this was there to help me grow and become someone not get something or get somewhere but become someone and that's why in this path of returning constantly to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we can never be the losers we can never think that we're too late we can never think that it's too late and too much wrong has already happened or too much has been lost or or uh, you know i've awakened too late never in this moment if you have awakened remember this is exactly how it was meant to be this is exactly how you were supposed to be this is exactly how things were meant to be and this moment is a reminder for you to say if you have awakened in this moment this was your perfect moment and in this moment if we can ask for salamti of the heart then with all the inner awareness with all the inner knowing with all the inner realization of my anxieties of my fears of all of that is going on within me i come to a place of saying from now i do my life from a place of awareness and light and empowered empoweredness feeling the power within me of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala him standing by me and then we will start seeing a shift we, if if the shift is happening within us it's a natural phenomena the shift has to happen on the outside but again not getting focused on the outcome in the outer realm but constantly bringing our attention back to our intention of inner transformation always 
So friends, I'm going to um, I'm going to now just um, you know end the session here because I gotta go, um, and I'll uh, just make a short toa of salamti o Allah, fill our hearts with peace, fill our hearts with your serenity and tranquility, so that just like the ocean, where there may be storm and lightning and thunder on the outside, deep inside the ocean there is always calm and peace. And those living in the ocean, the life that the ocean supports, feel the security. Oh Allah, bring that security and peace into my heart because you are the Al-Malik. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad and wa ala Muhammad. I'm so sorry today we can't stay back and do the question answers. I would request you all to keep me and my family in your prayers. And I will see you all next week. Until then. Lots of love and prayers for all of you of peace and blessings and safety. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fatma, for your love. Thank you, Fem. Thank you, Naseem Aunty, for giving me this company through your open camera. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Lots of love. Take care. Khadafiz.